Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. The legendary aerobatic helicopter pilot Chuck Aaron is here, and I'm telling you, it is going to be a ton of fun getting to talk to him because I have spent time with this man, and it is, it is always astounding and amazing stuff. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, we are roaring with Social Flight's Fly to Win Challenge. We are giving away a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset on April 1st, and all you need to do is to get the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices. Check in at win at your local airport. Just check in once you're entered into that uh, drawing in order to win. If you fly to multiple locations, get more points by checking in as you fly, then you could get on our leaderboard, get extra entries into that drawing. We're just here to get people flying and support general aviation. That is what we do here at Social Flight. And of course, we have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations, so many things happening in there. It's all available on socialflight.com and our mobile apps. In addition, when you log in, uh, you'll be able to see Social Flight's FAA learning system where you can watch videos on your time and your schedule for wings credit with the FAST team as well as if you're a, a maintenance technician, you can take get AMT credits for their awards program with the Aviation Maintenance Technician Awards Program. And if you are an AMP with inspection authorization, you can get your eight hours of education for that renewal for free on Social Flight. Just go get there, look at the FAA credit section of Social Flight, watch the courses, take the quizzes, get those certificates. It's all free and all within Social Flight to support general aviation. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Avidyne and the amazing 550, 540, and 440 series of IFD navigators. Uh, and their uh, new Vantage system that is going to be replacing so many Cirrus cockpits as well. Um, I'll tell you, I have been flying behind uh, Avidyne equipment for a very long time, fly with it. Uh, we have multiple systems in the Bonanza. We're putting them in the uh, Mustang. You can see one right here behind me. And the thing I appreciate most is that when we are trying to get somewhere, we're flying hard IFR, you don't, it's just everything is natural. You do not have to worry about what happens when you're issued a clearance you're not expecting or have to do a hold or something. Um, it just makes it easy. Everything is just simple and you can use either buttons or touch screen. It's all right there. And so a big thank you to Avidyne for supporting general aviation, for uh, making replacements, slide in replacements available when the old Garmin navigators are getting decommissioned and no longer serviceable. Um, they, they do a lot to support GA and we really appreciate it. Now to tonight's guest. Chuck Aaron is a lifelong pilot with over 20,000 accident-free hours, including over 18,000 flight hours in 33 helicopter models. But what he is most known for is transforming air shows and astounding audiences with some of the most amazing aerobatic helicopter flying that the world has ever seen. He has received some of the highest honors in aviation, including HAI's Pilot of the Year Award, the Art Scholl Award, membership in the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, and the Living Legends of Aviation Award. And he is the only man that I know that can rock the combination of a tuxedo and sandals at the same time. Chuck is the original man at the helm of the original Red Bull aerobatic helicopter. And tonight we're gonna to hear that story and many more. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, the one and only Chuck Aaron. Hey, hey Chuck, everybody. how are you? <laughs> you doing great, how you doing? Good to Thank see you. you. Thank you so, so much for joining us here tonight. I'll tell you, I, I love it any time that we get a chance to talk. Well, uh, thank you. It's and uh, and I did also enjoy when we were out at Legends getting to kick back with you as you uh, get to get to swap stories and and hold court there. And I I mean that thing for anybody yeah. who has not seen you rock the tech the tuxedo with sandals or uh, flip, you're pretty much wearing those everywhere you go. Flip flops. Flip I'm flops. sorry. I didn't mean to yeah. put you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh. Yeah. It, it's it's something that's that started years ago because I was getting too hot in the cockpit. That's, I, I wound up working my way down from, you know, wearing a flight suit and boots and gloves and helmet and sweating like crazy 
in in the cockpit and i uh decided you know if i was to crash just how good are the, these flight suits they're, they're good for about three to five seconds they'll hold the the the, the uh burning uh flame away from you and i thought well the chances of me getting to that burning spot is going to be quicker if I'm wearing a flight suit because I'm going to be sweating all the way and that might even cause it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so years later, I, I took off the flight suit, took off the boots and put on shorts and put on a nice looking uh, t-shirt. And, and for my feet, I put on flip flops and it, it made it for me really easy to fly and much cooler. And I never did get hot or sweaty flying in the helicopter from that point on. So it, for me, it was a natural idea to, to, to do it uh, um, and, and be and be cool <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> I, I love it. And, it. and I have always seen that, the you know, it's always the people, the, the guys at the top of the company, the guys at the top all around, they're the ones that can dress casual. So you're, you're right. You, yeah, yeah. You wear it well, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> I want to start a little bit uh, at the beginning as we do and, and understand what, drew you to aviation and then what what pulled you into helicopters mm. my dad uh is the beginning of the story he uh 1937 uh he got his airplane license out in west texas in a little town called uh, um fort, fort, stockton. fort stockton texas and uh, uh this this oil man he was just out of high school and this oil man they just struck oil out there and this guy this guy had a lot of my oil bought an airplane and and started flying my dad went up to him and said hey i'll wash the airplane if you show me how to fly this thing the guy said deal so my dad took care of it for him and washed it and cleaned it all the time and and gave dad duel um after uh that was in 36 or something like that in 37 he, he got his first airplane and he started barnstorming with it and uh so he was barnstorming out in west texas in the late 30s until 1939 came along and Canada got into World War II. The U.S. was not in it yet. And uh, uh, um, so he went up to he went up to Canada. They hired him as a flight lieutenant and an instructor pilot for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And met my mother there. She's Canadian, and they got married. And then they're in Canada until December seventh, forty one happened, which was when U.S. got into World War II because of Japan bomb us. So um, uh, dad came back to the U.S. They, they, he got a presidential commission into the U.S. Army Air Corps. It wasn't Air Force then, it was called the Army Air Corps. And uh, so he got, and came in as a captain. He skipped both lieutenant spots and came in straight as, as a captain. And he stayed in the Air Force for, uh, for all of World War II, Korea and Vietnam and got out with 30 years in 1972. Wow. And uh, went on and, and did some civilian flying after that, flying jets and stuff. But meanwhile, during that period, I was growing up on the flight line and living and breathing airplanes. And uh, uh, my dad started teaching me how to fly airplanes. And one day I had about 100 hours in planes and we were flying together one day. And he knew this guy that had this Bell 47 helicopter. And, want to know if I want to ride in it. I thought, well, sure, I'll try it. So I get in the helicopter and I just fell in love with the helicopter. And I sw I switched right on the spot. I said, I got to do this. And I've been flying helicopters ever since. Thanks what, to my dad. What, what was it about the the switch to the helicopter that that just clicked for you? What, what was it that just made yeah. you change? It was that awesome feeling of freedom and really flying i mean i in an airplane you you know you can only go forward and an up you know and in a helicopter you can go any direction your heart desires and you're flying you can pick it straight up from the ground as you always do and then you can back it up or you can go forward or you can go sideways you can take off and go forwards with it and in my case you can loop it and roll it and you can do everything with it so i've i've got it tuned down to where you can do any kind of flying you want any kind of your heart desires. So the, it, it seems to me the only thing I, the, I've ever done in a helicopter is embarrass myself trying to hover in an ends room without any uh, governor yeah. on it. But it, yeah. it seems to me that it's the closest thing to like having a flight suit on the, that like you, you, you know, a, a flying suit or something that you can 
you, it's just you. You can go anywhere you want as, as you can get yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I used to fly that, you're talking about an F-28A uh, instrument. I've flown those. I know exactly which one you're talking about. Got hand yeah. throttle. You have to turn throttle with exactly. your hand. Yeah. I was absolutely and, terrible at that. You give me, yeah. give me this, this, give me everything while you're flying and cruising in it, and it's like, oh, this is simple. But yeah. five, five feet off the ground, forget it. Oh, yeah. Once you slow it down, it's a different animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going straight and level, you think you're in a plane, but boy, as soon as you change that, it's all everything else comes into play. You're, you're, you go from flying straight and level with your cyclic stick. Moving forwards and backwards, left and right, just it's just like an airplane. Does exactly like an airplane. So but if you want so, to slow down, it's all different. All you start using up all the controls. So you switch. So you switched over. You got that that classic bell that we all see flying over. You know, Oshkosh Air Venture. You know, taking tours yeah. that everybody's seen in Mash and all these other things. Um, yeah. Where'd you go? Where'd you go from there? Uh, um. I went and uh, I told my dad I want to get my helicopter license. And there's a place in Saluda, South Carolina called South Carolina Helicopters owned by a guy named Les Emble. And uh, uh, they had, and I was out fresh out of the Army, had full VA benefits and uh, took my VA benefits up to Saluda, South Carolina and got my commercial helicopter license with it from them and started crop dusting first job my very first job flying was crop dusting in a helicopter oh wow uh, yeah uh, uh, over cotton and uh and, and soybeans and some corn and did that for one year survived it had just over a thousand hours flying time in one year uh flew six days a week sun up to sundown got paid 250 dollars an hour and uh I didn't care so much about the money as I did. I wanted the flying time. Anyway, so I got uh, I got that done in one year, thousand hours. Um, and then I, I left there, went back to this guy named uh, um, Bob Showalter, owned a Showalter Flying Service in Orlando, Florida, and he had just bought a brand new instrument like you were just talking about, um, and he didn't have an instructor. And uh, and I had just gotten my instructor rating from the guy I got my pro commercial license from in, in Saluda. And my mother had read this article that this guy, uh, Showalter, Bob Showalter, wanted an instructor to teach in an instrument F-28A brand new he just got. So I just finished what we call defoliating. And that's, that's when you're done spraying the cotton for the boll weevil. And then defoliating is the last thing you do. So you, knock off all the the, the uh, leaves off of them and then you this machine goes through and pull picks the cotton and uh so i just finished that when that, my mom called me up and told me about this job opportunity right there in orlando and so i hightailed it back to orlando and told bob so i want to do it and uh i talked to him and let me do it i said i said he said how much you want for it and i said i'll do it for free but uh for every hour that i get you that you don't have right now for every hour I find for you to on this helicopter, you're going to pay me $25 an hour. He said, how can I lose deal? So, <laughs> so anyway, he got, he got me checked out in that thing. And, and that was a first uh, job again, flying this time was a, uh, an, an, the Enstrom. And that, that went on to, uh, I bought a Bell 47 for train. Then I got a, a little Schweitzer because I started doing radio con uh, talk for traffic in Orlando mm -hmm. and a little helicopter called WH for the radio station was WHOO, the who copter, we call it. And it was a country Western station, but we did traffic all, all around Orlando and a little Schweitzer, huge two, six, nine. And I flew that and I was called captain Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay. I, 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 so I, I did that. that. I, I did, I, I, I had that contract for about five years, and and then while I was doing that, you know, w, ABC News, uh, WFTV Channel Nine, Orlando, um, uh, came to me and was interested in getting a a helicopter for their news station, and I won that contract for them too. So I had both of them go at the same time, 
And so got, the companies just started like that, just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then I got some government contracts and had to hire more people and, and had a lot of work to do. And I was working seven days a week. And anyway, it went on for a long time. So it's been, it's been, it's been fun. I mean, life has been fun for me. It's, it's full of, I've been flying ever since uh, I started crop dusting. It seems, so today. it seems to me that one of the big turning points for you came around your, your, your interest in the Cobras. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Was that, was it, was it yeah. your big, big thing that happened before that? Or am I jumping ahead too much? Or is that, was that big turning point? Uh, that came later. Uh, that, that was probably 10 years later, About 10 years had passed after that point where I just finished. What were you, and during what were you that doing time, during the time? Well, um, I got a job with NASA, uh, um, a contract with NASA. They they wanted me to go, come over there and start filming um, once a week. No, once a month, I'd go over there and I'd film uh, the space shuttle runway. They were building it. They're building the runway. And so Congress wanted a photograph of the construction and where it was and, and how it was coming because it's a 15,000 foot runway that's a couple hundred feet wide. And I think it was three to six feet deep of all concrete and steel rebar. And they wanted, they're throwing a lot of money at it. And so they wanted to see this thing as it was being built. So I had a contract doing that. And while I was doing that, the Navy saw me over there because it's right there, Cape Canaveral. And the Navy saw me fl flying there every day, once a month. And they, con they hired me and they contracted me to start filming uh, the building, I can't tell you the details of it, the building, the Trident sub base is there, the nuclear mm. sub base there. And so they had me filming that and I would film the subs going offshore and, and you know, 20 miles offshore, they go out on the surface and they dive. And when they come back in, they let me know and I'd go out there and wait on, they'd pop up and I'd fall them back in and I filmed all that stuff too. And then, then, um, NASA came along and was looking for uh, someone to run the space shuttle air rescue program. And my father was in the Air Force, as I told you, and his last 15 years in the Air Force was being commanding officer of air rescue squadrons all over the U.S., all over the world, actually. And um, so he was a natural at it and could teach me how to do air rescue. And uh, they, NASA hired me to be a NASA pilot to run their air rescue department and I was, my job was to be responsible for that for up to the lives of up to six astronauts at one time anywhere from ground zero to 150 nautical miles offshore wow. so and that's written in a contract when i because i was a s an, call it an s an s an s something uh i was a 13 whatever uh -huh. whatever that was. um and and so they write on your contract and they're exactly what you're supposed to do. And, and, and my job was specifically, I was responsible for the lives of up to six astronauts from anywhere from ground zero to 150 nautical miles offshore. So I got to learn the space shuttle per itself a lot. The cockpit, I got to go in the cockpit a lot and just see it and check out the egress route in case you're sitting there on a launch pad and you need to get out and, the cable system they had set up so you could get out of, this, out of that thing if there was a thing caught on fire on the, on the ground. You could slide down this 200 foot line and hit this little basket at the end. And uh, used to, you know, practice going through all that stuff and practice if they went five miles offshore with, with a helicopter. I had two UH 1H, two UH 1B Huey helicopters to do that program with, which was not sufficient. Um, I want to quitting NASA over that very subject because they couldn't get me a bigger helicopter because I was responsible for six astronauts and the Huey would only carry three. And so that put me in an awkward position to where I couldn't do my job. Um, anyway, so we had a bit of a falling out over that. And I left there, went back to my other job that I was doing contract work with that I if, if, if I haven't confused everyone yet, I actually sold that to go to work for NASA. Anyway, I came back after NASA and I had a no compete clause. And the, so then I started buying helicopters in, in a shop and I'd rebuild them and, and sell them. And I did that for 10 years. And during that process, 
there's an outfit called DRMO, which stands for Defense Reutilization Marketing Office. And it's a military program. If you sign up for it and register with it like I did, um, then you can bid on these government contracts where they'd sell scrap metal to anybody that wanted to buy them. And there's all kinds of, and, and lots. And so whatever's in the lot, you get. So you bid on the lot and it, it usually gets sold for between six and eight cents a pound back in the nineties when I was doing this early nineties. And one day I just tripped over a Cobra helicopter that was there in the lot. And, uh, it had been in Afghanistan and a Chinook had hovered by it. It was a functional helicopter. A Chinook had hovered by it and blew it over. So the army <laughs> scrapped it and they put it on a, on a, on a ship and sent that sucker back to the U S and pull off all the running gear off of it and sold the fuselage as junk. I saw it in the thing there and knew it was going to come up for bid. And I said, I think I'm going to try and get this thing. So I bid on it and I bid like 12 cents a pound instead of six or eight cents a pound. I want to make sure I got it and I got it. So I literally stole it and it was all there, the fuselage wise. There's no instruments, no yeah. wiring, no in, no engines, uh, no uh, the engines, the, the, rotor, the rotor head or blades weren't there, but the airframe is complete. So I bought it that way. And then that was right about the time that the army was in the, the new Sikorsky Comanche program, the Comanche, are, they're trying to sell the Comanche to the, to the, uh, to the army. And so the army wanted it, the Comanche really bad. And so they started unloading all the Cobras they had and sent them to the various DRMOs to strip and sell and get rid of those things. They also had, the army also had an in inventory spare parts for these Cobras, brand new, never used. And I knew that. And so when they come up, I needed you know, all the, the Cobra I bought had been demilled. And so they, they'd cut it in various places to make sure that people like me couldn't come and pick it up and fly it. And um, I, I got it anyway. And um, I, I was smart enough to go, uh, go through a Freedom of Information Act. And I got all the tech manuals, or the support manuals, the flight manuals, the, the maintenance manuals, the structural manuals for everything to do with that Cobra. And I uh, took my Cobra and drilled it, took it all apart and found out where they'd cut the main beams out of it to, to demill it. And then they were, the army and their wisdoms was selling all those parts in, in, in the <laughs> DRMO brand new, never installed. <laughs> you need to take out this so, old main beam and then we'll sell you a brand new main beam. Brand new. Yep. For two cents on the pound or two cents. Uh, six cents on a dollar, yeah. Or six, no, six cents for the pound, and uh, and we're talking, you know, hundred thousand dollar parts, you know, that are going for five bucks, and uh, it's it was crazy. I was able to rebuild that Cobra and bring it back to brand new condition. Uh, I hired one mechanic and one electrician. Uh, Randy Cuts was the electrician I hired. And super good guy, super straight up, love the guy. Lives out in Arizona, and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name. The mechanic I hired, I, he was a, he was a car mechanic. And I taught him how to be an airplane mechanic. He was a really good wrench. He never over torqued anything. He did everything I told him to do, and he's really good. I'm an AMP too, so um, I, I taught him how to do the wrenching, and he did a really good job. He and I did all the wrenching together, and Randy did all the wiring, and we put a brand new. Um, uh, wiring harness in it and got it all finished and flying. And then when, when I got it all finished and flying, the, the the FAA wouldn't let me fly it because I didn't have a type or no one, you know, I'd never flown a Cobra. So they told me, so you gotta get somebody that's on active duty to check you out on that thing. So I took a deep breath, thought about it for a while. So I called Fort Campbell, Kentucky. <laughs> I said, give me your chief pilot. And so I got this chief pilot on the phone. I said, look, at, I get this Cobra <laughs> in my spare pocket, in my back pocket here. And I need someone to check me out. And I said, what do you know over the weekend? Can I can I hire you over the weekend? And fly? I'll fly you up here first class from Campbell to Chicago where I was building this thing. And I want you to show me how to start this thing and hover it. And uh, 
he said, sure, I'll do that. So he did. I brought him up and he got me all checked out and we, we hovered it. And, and, uh, but before he got there, I did all my power checks. I took the, I had actually been running it and I took straps and I strapped the thing to the ground. Uh, you, know, you know, when you pull up in an airplane, you got those big rings in the, in the concrete where you tie your plane down to. So yeah. I used those and I strapped the straps down to those things on both sides and the, and the belly. So I can pull, so I can start the helicopter up and pull full power with it strapped down really hard to the ground and get full power out of it to prevent it from taking off. So I could track the blades. I could do balance and track the blades. And I could, I, so I got that all finished before he got there. Anyway, he got there and he went through the starting procedure with me. So I was technically correct. And um, and then we went up, flew it, smooth, smooth as glass. And he was real happy with it for an hour. And the FAA um, gave me my check ride. I got my first AH1 type certificate. And uh, that was in 90, 92, I think it was 92. And uh, um, and off I was running on that. So it was just, I wanted to get two, two others and and built them over the court. Each one, each one took me two and a half years to do, to rebuild. And, uh, I, and I started doing movie work. You kind of, did you, didn't you go in, straight to the FAA office and, and managed to kind of find a <laughs> Cut way. Cut it to... off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew the Fed, I knew the feds would be all over me if, and trying to take that Cobra back once they found out I had it. And I was building it, when I was building it, I was building this, in this on this private property, 180 acres that had a fence all the way around it. Nobody could get into it unless you had the code. And so I, I bought it and brought it back to this building in there, and this building was all mine, and that's where I built it inside. But when I got a, about three quarters of the way done, I guess heard, heard that someone was looking for a cobra. And I went, oh, I wonder if they're looking for me. And it's probably the feds. And so I jumped on an airliner, took off the very next day, went straight to Oklahoma City, and I, I registered it with FAA. As soon as I registered with FAA, it was legally mine. They couldn't touch it because I did it the right way. I owned it and I owned up to it, and it's entitled with the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. People so don't know just you can a, walk in there if you actually go out to Oak City. Yeah, I did. That was now. That was back in the mid '90s, but it, it worked, and that's exactly what I did. I even got their attorneys in in, in front of me because they'd never had someone walk in there and want to license a Cobra, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I did so I but I came back with a certificate said I was I was, I was re registered with the FAA and, and it was a, it was legally and with my address on it and I owned it and I gave it a serial number the whole shoot match so I came back and then after I got back I I, I called ATF and I said you guys looking for me <laughs> and he said funny thing you asked yes we are and <laughs> Uh, and he said, they told me on the phone, I, said, I, I heard you got something to do with the Cobra. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, uh, do you mind if we take a look at it? I said, sure, come on out of here. <laughs> so they had a team of about five guys the next morning showed up the front door. I mean, at the gate. So I'd go out there and let them in the gate and brought them back there. And I showed them the whole thing. And they were like, right, ready to get the handcuffs out. And I, and I said, pull this thing right out of my top pocket this registration card said check this out i own it <laughs> and i bought it from you thank you very much <laughs> and and i got the receipt for it so they went oh, they couldn't believe it i said yeah i did it all right i did it all legal and everything was an up and up and and it worked out so they left me alone that so that's have, like, that's what got me, left that's what got me. Interesting. interesting look on yeah, their face it, it did. It did. They thought, I thought I was going to go to jail that day, too, but I had a grin on my face all done. I, I knew I had the card, so I knew I could get away with this. And um, so I played with them a little bit on it. Um, <laughs> anyway, that led to a movie called The Rock with Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. You ever heard of that that movie? Oh, yeah. It's real, real yeah. famous. So there's two Cobras in that movie, and I'm flying one of them. They both belong to me and my partner. I had a, I had a, financial partner that paid for everything. He wasn't he wasn't a mechanic or nothing, he's just a 
had a lot of money. And he bought whatever I asked him to. And we got into this COVID, got into this COVID thing by accident. And I said, let's build this thing. And he was all, he's all for it. So we did it. And um, so anyway, this movie thing came up and they wanted me really bad. And they wanted both my Cobras. I had two by then. And, um, and both of them are like brand new. And so we flew them from Chicago out to San Francisco and shot that film with it. And that started me in the movie business was that that movie and i did a whole bunch of other movies since then the last movie i did that well-known one was the was the james bond movie um specter and that was uh just came out about five six years ago and it was the opening sequence of that movie was me flying the b0105 helicopter doing aerobatics so the first 15 minutes of that movie opening scene was that was that aerobatic part that made it really fun for me too Wow. And, and the movie. So that's kind of how I got to that scene. And uh, during that time, I had met a lot of cool, fun people, especially. In, uh, I, I, I joined a, uh, a really good organization called the QBs and mm-hmm. uh, met some, had got some really good friends there, met a bunch of test pilot friends of mine. I got to meet, uh, used, a lot in my life. Uh, um, uh, t- Tom Rums- Rumsfeld, by the way, is one of them. I hope he's listening tonight. Tom is a test pilot from, uh, I'm, th- I'm going to think it was Boeing. Whoever built the F-22 and the F-35, he flew them both. Mm. He's first pilot. And uh, and uh, quite a guy. He was, our, he was in our group there. We had a bunch of test pilots and I was that's I happen to be Morgan a tech, by that time I happen to be one. Yeah. Pardon me? That's that is that Tom Morganfeld? Yeah, Tom Morganfeld. Yeah. Yep. Um I had other test pilots helping me do the rebuild the the helicopter, the Red Bull helicopter. That's a different story, I'll tell you that in a second. But let me finish this one. So anyway, <laughs> this one that's how I got in the movie business and did Quiet Birdman and and been a member for a bunch of years with that organization and a great team of guys that that tell war stories that are true stories that are fun <laughs> and uh airplane stories did, and uh, uh once a month. did the army ever uh get get a little grumpy about you owning that uh, uh cobra as they found out oh uh yeah now that you mentioned that you remind me of another story so <laughs> <laughs> he said um, knowingly uh, yeah. So I, I get this, I get this, uh, I find out through the grapevine, there's a, there's an outfit called Quad A. And Quad A is Army Aviation something administration. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's an annual helicopter convention, not a helicopter, it's an annual Army convention where they sell, civilians go there and they sell all their wares, like be it a machine gun or a tank or a, Cobra helicopter or this or that, all the army picture stuff product. the army guys wear, all yeah, all of them. And it was called Quad A, and this and that particular year that was a ninety three or four, one of two. Uh, that was ninety three. It was in Fort Worth, Texas. So I flew the Cobra from Chicago and I flew it down there to Fort Worth. A registered guide in guide in it, they, and I told him I had a Cobra. I didn't. They, they just figured I was an army guy coming down and um, and, it's, and, it's, and it looks brand new. I mean, inside now it's got all new wiring, all new, you know, uh, every component is either brand new or zero time since overhaul. And um, um, I got it there. I had to land it on the street downtown Fort Worth and put the wheels on it. And we rolled it inside the convention center and, Got it all set up on this carpet and got this little wooden stand next to it so I could open up the cockpit door and let people come by to look at it. And they could walk up this little wooden step and look inside the cockpit and see inside. And I had the side doors open so you could look at the transmission. I, 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 the, everything everything was brand new or zero time in there. The transmission, when it was overhauled, I had it painted gold just so it looked cool. And the outside of the helicopter was all flat black. And, so when the, when the doors are all closed up, it's all flat black. But when you open it up to maintenance, everything in there is either yellow, zinc chromate, or is painted gold. And the 
main transmission was that way and the mast pole and rotor head, it's all gold. And uh, I had someone paint the Ten Commandments on the side of it for me <laughs> up on the on the sail so that, like, don't mess with me. This is uh, kind of attitude on the helicopter. And I'm sitting there in, in Quad A, and this is the best part of the story. I'm sitting there in Quad A, my own business. I'm wearing a, I look like a normal guy. I've got short hair and, and um, wearing a blue business suit and, and hard shoes on, no flip-flops. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> along with my mechanic and my uh, electrician were standing there. And I was trying to sell the Army. I brought it there because I wanted to sell the Army the new wiring system that I just designed for it, which made a Teflon. And uh, it used to have capped on in it. That's that gold color mm -hmm. wire that's lighter weight. And and uh, and you, you can see it real easy because it's copper colored. Yep. And that stuff after about 10 years would internally corrode and it's short out. And so the, the army was big into getting rid of all the capped on they had in their wiring system and go to Teflon or Tefzel and same stuff, but it just had a plastic coating and it didn't corrode. And anyway, we had all new wiring in it, the Teflon, Tefcel. And uh, so while well, I'm sitting there, in the, and if you can picture yourself inside this big convention center, and, and then a couple thousands of people are in there, and they're all in the military, I see this group coming at me of wad of people all jammed together. And it, it turns out that... Um, one of them is the secretary of the Air Force. His name was Togo West, and I didn't know it. But he's wearing he's wearing his business suit, and big guy. And so he was surrounded by four star and three star and two star generals around him, and photographers. And so that he's walking by and he's seeing this Humvee and he's seeing this, you know, big old machine gun. And then he comes over and sees this other weapon and this new type of jeep and. He gets up to me and sees my Cobra and he looks and I'm standing there in my blue business suit rather than a military uniform. He goes, who are you? I said, I said, uh, I own this Cobra right here. He goes, what? He said, <laughs> yeah, I said, yeah, that's my Cobra. I want you to take a look at it. I want you to look at my wiring harness I built just for you. And I want, it. I've got the whole design for it and I built a wiring board for it. So you could, I could, I could multiply as many as you want really quickly so you could put it in the field on your army cobra helicopters and get them get all that that capped on out of them and that made him interested and i said come up here in this little wooden step up here and look inside and i'll show you all around so he, he gets up there and looks around he's he's in a gray i can still really see him he's got a gray suit and um he starts looking all over it and he's it, it literally looked like it was brand new inside i mean it looked awesome all the glasses brand new, all the, all the leather inside is brand new, and all the instruments are new or zero times is over. They all look brand new. The, every, every, all the, everything's like brand new. And uh, he goes, this is yours? And, he, and I said, yes, sir. And he says, well, how'd you get it? And I spent the five minutes explaining to him. I bought it from DRMO. And he said, you did this yourself? I said, yes, sir. And he says, well, how long did it take you to do it? I said, I did it in about... 14, 1500 hours of labor. He says, no way, you can't do it that fast. And I said, well, try me. <laughs> Give me another one of yours and I'll, show, and I'll do it again. Um, he, he, he didn't, he, he liked what I did, but he changed because of it. Unfortunately, I had no idea this was gonna happen, but he got so upset that me, Chuck Aaron, a nobody, civilian, owned a Cobra. And it was all there, except I didn't have any of the weapon systems on it, you, and just fake stuff on it. And uh, he changed the rules. And the rule change was, because I did everything right, and he couldn't stop me or the next guy from doing it. They changed the rules so that everybody at DRMO had a Cobra part. If it had a 209-something on it, that means it was Cobra. Uh, it had to be cut in half before they could sell it. Oh, so there was God. no more, you, yeah, there was no more used Cobra parts out there for sale that were complete. Even, even a little short rod, it was everything had to be cut in half. Everything had to be cut in half before it could be sold. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, unfortunately the bad guy in that situation. I didn't see it coming. 
wasn't my fault, but it was his way to stop it from happening again. But it was mm -hmm. an easy way to, I mean, I just saw the my I just saw our government throwing money away like crazy, like they still do, when they could be doing this with civilians, like Elon Musk is doing with NASA. I mean, look at Elon Musk. He knows how to launch a missile and get it back. <laughs> <laughs> NASA could never do that. You know, I mean, let civilians do their thing. You know, and 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 give us more a little a little more. Uh, uh, credit that we can do what we say we can do, and, and we and yeah. we're most of us are pretty energized, and we'll do it and can do it. And we'll do it. Um, so was there, that the was that the pivotal thing that connected you with Dieter over at at Red Bull? That that helicopter. Uh, that was yeah. So yeah, well, I, after I, after that, then we jumped forward to the. I moved. I wound up moving. That movie came out. Uh, um, um, the one I told us about a minute ago, and um, The Rock with Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. That got me to California to do that movie. And then I thought I'd, I, I love California. I've never been there. I love California so much. It's so beautiful. I just had to go back there again. Uh, so I kept the Cobras there and put them in a hangar and started doing other movies and, and other um, TV commercials with them. And, um, then Dietrich, the owner of Red Bull, Dietrich Mashes, the owner of Red Bull, found out I had this Cobra, and I owned it, and I was a civilian, and he wanted it. And, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, and of course, Dietrich Mashes, who doesn't, who, if you don't know him out there, he owns the sole owner of Red Bull, and he's the inventor of Red Bull and the and the mixture that's in it, and he personally told me a story about how he got that cool story in itself but anyway he got that and he got an investing partner and he built up red bull to a four billion dollar a year company and uh he wanted my cobra he's got he's got a 35 aircraft that all fly and they're all from world war ii and up to current little little two-seat jets and he wanted my Cobra. He didn't have one, of course. And uh, he won that for his, for his crowd. And he, he's got a Falcon 900, and he flew it from Austria where he lives and came over to L.A. to see this thing. He saw it, fell in love with it. And I gave him a, excuse me, I gave him a ride in it, took him around the block in it. And he said, I'll take it. We landed it. And soon we landed, he said, I'll take it. So I said, uh, after, so we're talking, and he said, I just took your best toy away from you, didn't I? I said, yeah, you did. He says, why don't you go to work for Red Bull now? I said, well, you got nothing for me to do. And he says, yeah, I'll make you the chief pilot for Red Bull, director of maintenance for all North America, Red Bull North America. And I said, we'll get you a helicopter somewhere, and you fly it, and you take care of it, and do all the jobs you want to do. And I'll, I'll, I said, well, uh, he owns a company worldwide, so I, the Red Bull North America is headquarters in Santa Monica. So you take, so we go from my airport, which is 50 miles north of Santa Monica, 40 miles north of Santa Monica, went down to Santa Monica airport, went to his office there, grabbed his president for Red Bull North America out of his office and said, I've hired Chuck Aaron. He's going to be our, he's, he's going to be our pilot. You're going to put him on your payroll and you're going to pay for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told. That's, that's a guy uh, used uh, to hearing things and, uh, like that, I think, and just saying yes. Yeah, yeah. And it was, and the guy's name was Dan Ginsburg. I love Dan. I don't know where Dan is today. He's out there somewhere. He went. He wound up stayed with Red Bull for like five, six more years, and I had a ball with that guy. That guy was perfect. We got along like two peas in a pod. And anything I wanted to do with that Cobra, he said yes. And um, and it, oh, during that oh, so many, back up a few days right before he after he bought the cobra from me and and before he took me down to meet dan ginsburg the, the ceo of red bull north america he asked me if i could do aerobatics in a helicopter and i went no nah, you can't do it. no that's that's a no we're not doing aerobatics in a helicopter and he said okay fine so anyway we did the thing with dan and said hellos and goodbyes and he took got in his falcon 900 and he went back to austria and um, 
about two weeks go by and I'm, I can't stop thinking about him asking me about doing airbags in a, in a, an air and a helicopter. And so my gears are turning a hundred percent of the time. And I knew that if you had enough money, you could make anything, do anything. And, and I knew he had enough money to make one of those things happen. <laughs> and so I just happened to see uh, someone told me I was talking to someone about it. And he says, watch this little video clips on YouTube about the BO 105 during original flight tests. And this guy named Charlie Zimmerman's doing this, this aerobatic maneuvers in it. And I went, no way. And so I, I found it on YouTube, saw it and watched him doing this, all this crazy stuff. And it was just for flight tests. It wasn't a, a regular thing that he was doing. And, uh, and it wasn't, it was doing a, a, a good job with it and doing one to do a great job with it. He was doing a good job with it. And it's the first time I'd ever seen a helicopter do aerobatics in the first place. So actually it was a, it was a good job. And, um, um, so I called Dietrich and I said, Dietrich, maybe I, I had Dietrich's cell phone. So I called him on a cell phone two weeks later. And I said, Dietrich, maybe I could, we might be able to do this. If I, if I had a, bought a B0105 and I modified it and, I said, there's never been one certified in the world to do aerobatics. No helicopters ever made that pass that mark. I said, we got a shot at it. If I get the right FAA guy, local right FAA guy to be my monitor and mentor and helper. And if I got the right helicopter, which I think would be the B0105, and let's take it, we could modify it. And I barely got that out of my mouth. And he said, do it. I'll, I'll pay for it. I don't care what it takes. Just make it happen. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> so I hung up the phone and I called ERA, which is um, a helicopter company in um, in, in uh, Louisiana, uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And they used to operate like 50 of them offshore. And I bought two from them over the phone. And I said, I want a spare part, spare engines, spare rotor blades, spare this, spare that, spare that. So I got two complete BO-105s with all the spares. I flew down there and picked one up at a time, flew it all the way back to my hangar in Camarillo and I got them both there um, over a period of about two weeks. And I took, kept one in normal category. The other one I called the feds on. I said, all right, I'm going to, I want to, I want to modify this one to do aerobatics. And they all started scratching their heads. They all knew me really well that I'd done and what I had done with the Cobra. I literally brought that Cobra from, the boneyard uh, looking like new. They all knew I had the ability to do all that heavy work. And I told them what I want to do, and they all thought I was going to die. And they said, you're crazy, Chuck. Don't do that. And I said, no, nah, I want to do it. I want to try it at least. So they let me do it. And I, I, I gutted it out, stripped one of them completely down to bare metal, right down to nothing to get all the weight out of it. And then I put up, I, I won't tell you what, what I did, but I did I did beef it up some. I beefed up the tail some. I changed the center of gravity of it quite a bit. I made it nose heavy. Uh, I made it nose heavy because if you take a helicopter and you throw it in the water, it goes upside down and it sinks straight down because all the weight is on the rotor head. And um, so if you do that in the air and you get it upside down, you stall it, it's going to stay upside down and it won't recover from that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure it was nose heavy to. So it pulled through that. Anyway, I got all that done and I beefed up there as it need to get beefed up and and uh, so I could do it multiple times. And then the Fed said, okay, I want you to put a camera in, in the in between the pilot seat and the co-pilot seat. And I want you to put the camera so it looks exactly at the and shows the complete instrument panel. And I want you to put a G meter in there. And we want to be able to see everything in there, including the G meter. And then we want you to put another camera in there and above it so it looks outside so we can see what's going on outside. So we can see the ground rolling and looping and all that stuff. And then you put five hours on it and show us the videos and then take it from there. And so that's, that's, that, so I did all that. It worked perfect and I didn't over G it. And uh, they, I got it, I got certified for three and a half positive G's to a negative one G. And no helicopters have ever been certified to one negative G. Um, and certification today, though, almost all helicopters are certified to three, I think, three, if not three and a half positive Gs. 
Um, but nobody can do a negative one G because the blades will bend down, they'll cone downwards and chop the tail off. But this one with the RPM it had and the modification it did to it, it wouldn't do that. Mm. And oh, I had another third camera. I forgot to tell you about it. I had it on the tail boom where the tail rotor blades are and it looked right at the rotor blades. You can see the entire disc completely and you can see the rotor head right in the middle and you can see the flex of the blades, you know, when they bend up and down. Uh, so you can see that during flight test when I was doing all that flight test for that. And um, so between that rear uh, camera and the camera on the cockpit and the camera that looked out front and then seeing my air speeds and my altitudes and the control I had of the aircraft and didn't over G it and they they want to uh, give me the very first ever in the world certified aerobatic helicopter. Wow. And it was, wow. yeah, the tail number is N154 Echo Hotel and Red Bull is still flying that one today. <laughs> <laughs> That is absolutely amazing. And then, of course, you went on to to uh, to to build and and perfect that routine uh, that that we have seen uh, in the Red Bull helicopter. Uh, what did Dieter say the first, or how did he feel the first time he saw that and hit with his his brand, oh. his helicopter? Oh, he he was super proud. That guy was such a nice guy. I loved that guy. He treated me like a king, and he's such a kind. Very wealthy guy, but super kind, very generous, very generous person. Um, I didn't care for his cheap pilot, but I liked, I did like, I did like him, <laughs> and we got along. We got along great. He had a cheap pilot over there in, in Europe that was always jealous of me, and he always wanted. I was getting all the limelight, and he was getting Zippo. <laughs> you know? And I can understand him being feeling that way, and. You know, uh, you, you know the one thing I got to say real quickly about all of our test pilots that that they're out there now, like like uh, uh, oh, let me mention uh, Rich Lee, Kevin Bredenbeck, Tom Morgenfeld. There's three guys right there. They're all top helicopter pilots, and I'm uh, uh, well. Tom's not a helicopter pilot, but the two guys are. But they're, they're top test pilots, top guys. And uh, they're all really good friends of mine. And they were my mentors. And so if I had questions, I'd call them up, think about this and that. Right? It might be one or two questions and they'd know the answers. And it helped me, helped me do all my stuff. But those guys, I feel sorry for those guys. Those guys put their lives on the line way more than I did. Uh, I mean, here's uh, an F-22 or an F-35 that Tom flew that, you know, it, it, he, he got paid, you know, he's get regular pay for it. And he goes out and he, he's got to be the first person to get this thing off the ground and fly it. After they say it'll fly, they build it from scratch and say, go fly this thing. And he risks his life for it. And all these other test pilots do. And none of those guys get any pats on the back. You know, the, the, the only people that get a pats on the back is, is the president of the of Boeing or the president of, of Rockwell or the president of whoever the company has that built the aircraft, you know, the, the, yeah. the test pilot that did all the work, gets nothing. And that, right. that, that really it, it pisses me off. I, and, and I'm the one that wound up with all the accolades over, Oh, Chuck Aaron's is famous aerobatic helicopter pilot. Well, I'm not the first one, but I am the first one that got Red Bull through a gazillion dollars at the, the not just to finance, but to advertise. Mm -hmm. And so I, they, Red Bull sent me around all of the, all over the United States doing air shows everywhere and um, advertised me on the local news stations that I would be there. And, and I was on the cover of a bunch of newspapers and been on the cover of a bunch of magazines with me upside down in a helicopter. And it's, you know, I got all the accolades over it when it really these other guys that, was before me. I'm not the first guy. These other guys, these true test pilot guys that were before me, even though I am a test pilot, I'm not as good as those guys are. And they're the ones that should have gotten the pat on the back and they should have been recognized by their factory 
I'm ashamed of our factories taking up because uh, I know what they went through. I went through it myself, and, and they should have uh, they should have supported their their test pilots better than they did. Yeah, yes. yeah. That said, you've you've brought it to the limelight and made it possible for people to see it with images like this. Yeah, and, and the fact that you made all this yeah. possible through that that uh, we wouldn't know this even existed if it weren't for you and dear and the and the work you did to, together and and now yep. we can use that platform to thank all the test pilots and uh, yeah and get some to. of those in, and, and and we've said we'll have some of them on the show and tell their stories as well and we've had test pilots on as well and we always want to celebrate the people that made all that possible yeah yes um, sir now, when you uh, tell us, if you get helicopter pilots get rich lee get uh, kevin Bredden back he's in he's in West Palm Beach and Rich Lee's down in Mesa. Uh, you want fighter pilots? Get uh, uh, Tom Tom Morganfeld. Yep. So we will. We'll we get. We'll we'll definitely get all those guys. I want to talk a little bit in our remaining time about uh, some of the things you did that were really did break some barriers. You you came up with a maneuver, of course, that many people know about of the uh, Chukchivak. Tell <laughs> me a little yeah. bit about that. Describe that to it, us. Okay. Well, the Czech um, uh, of course, is a new term. Uh, it was called the Lumshavak, and if you're flying an airplane, so it, and a Lumshavak is is a, is a French name, and it's when you take an airplane, and you make it go totally out of control, and it looks like it's going to come apart and crash for sure. Anyway, that's called a Lumshavak. <laughs> So that's when a I was very, doing, that's a very a very uh, a specific way of describing it, of course, right? That's all yeah. the details. <laughs> that's yeah, <laughs> but that's pretty close. <laughs> and uh, so I did that. That's the way it felt to me when I was flying the helicopter. So I, I came up with this maneuver in the helicopter where I'd start off the air show with a Chuckslevac, and I I fly in sideways down the runway in the air show, and and I'd come in, I'd do a roll. And I come out of the roll and I pull it and go straight up, go to a vertical. And then just before it ran out of thrust going up, I push the nose over and get it, pull, pull, pull my hand down here. I get a level and then I was stopped. And then to prove to the crowds I was stopped, I'd do a 360 degree pedal turn all the way around like that. And I get it stopped again. And then I take the thing, I'd flip it over backwards. And I just literally just come over backwards the whole thing and fall down backwards, go straight down. And on the way straight down, I do a 180 degree vertical diving roll and then pull out of that. And and that's the Chuck Slovak. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is so, epic. And so for people out there, you can see it on YouTube. You look it up. It is yeah. it is an epic maneuver. It was difficult. And if we get, we get any more time left? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So let me tell you about my first loop. Uh, I know you wanted to ask, and I want to remind you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> after I, um, at, so I'm building this Cobra, I mean, this B105, trying to get it certified by the feds. And, and you know, a year, it took me 15 months. And every day I go to work and I'm, I'm turning wrenches, you know, I'm literally, I'm working at six days a week almost. And um, I finally get the dead gum thing done. And my head has been in that turning wrenches and adjusting this and adjusting that and miking this out, miking that out and putting this bolt in and putting this high lock in and putting in this, these new wiring and, grease scent and doing this and doing that and just making sure everything's right and my head is just completely dialed into doing work on the aircraft and all of a sudden i finished it and i go i'm finished <laughs> <laughs> so i get on the phone i call the feds up and i said all right come down look at this thing and they came right down they were there in an hour <laughs> and these two guys show up from the van eyes fizzo I said, here it is. Uh, I, and uh, I said, look it over. So they spent about an hour looking it over and said, geez, that looks like you did a pretty good job. I said, yeah, I'm ready to try it. And he goes, so he, without me even thinking, he said he pulls out his pad 
and he starts writing down this these notes on this thing and he gives me this little form about this big around little pink form and so my my uh airworthiness certificate temporary airworthiness certificate so i could go out and fly it five hours he says here's your pink slip go fly it i went oh it was a shocker to me. I mean, it was really like sweating, you know, really hard and getting into a cold shower. It, it, it was like a shocker. Uh, I didn't even think about flying. And I've been a year and a half of building this thing. And now I've got to go fly it. And it's, it just hit me all at once. Like I'm now I, I, I got this immediate feeling like I'm standing on the end of a diving board and there's sharks down below me, and they want, they want me to jump in. You know, it's like, oh my God, I gotta fly this thing now. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I took it out, and I had this particular place I went to all the time when I started going. I went to this one spot that was that was clear underneath me, and it was over by this mountain peak near Camarillo Airport. They're just on the just on the south side of the airport. There's this big anybody that knows that area. There's a big vertical wall there, this three thousand foot peak right there. And I'd fly up and down from there towards the ocean and back and parallel with that big wall. And there's nothing underneath me that, that I that if I crashed, I would hurt other than the trees. And I went out there and I would, first maneuver I'd try to do was a loop. So I'd, 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 um, I was at 2000 feet and I'd just go straight and I, and I would pull it up and I'd go vertical keep my hand on the picture here and I go vertical and I get to the point where I need to pull it on over to do the loop and I'd always chicken out and I'd roll that sucker out I'd fly away straight and I just I couldn't get past that my chicken point and I, I did that 50 times over a period of about a month I just couldn't get to the point of actually getting to, I'd get to the criticalest point of that thing I'll Oh, there's, I got to do something, you know, and, and I'd chicken out and I'd push the stick forward and I'd roll out and float away. So in flight tests, that's kind of what you do in flight tests. You know, you take, you, you go to, go to your limits, you take whatever it is you're flight testing and you take it to what your personal limits are and you don't exceed that. And that's, that's all part of the game of in flight tests. And, um, so I was reaching my limits each one of these times. And the, but this one day I got up, it was, I'll never forget it was in November. It was cool. It was crystal clear. You could see out over the ocean, a hundred miles, clear as a bell. And I went, and, I, and it was just, there was no wind, not a drop. The ocean was flat as flat gets flat. And, and I got up there and I was gonna go into my chicken point, flying towards the ocean. Get, get going and I pulled that sucker up. I got all the way up and that day, I don't know what got into me, but I said, I'm going for it. <laughs> I took a stick and I pulled it all the way back and came around that thing and did a perfect loop. And I came out of that loop and I, I was so ex exhilarated. I, I, I couldn't believe I did it. And it was when I did do it, it was so easy. I did it again. And immediately and then I did it again and I did it actually 10 times in a row non-stop each time because I didn't want to forget what I just did and I want to do the same maneuver again and I want to do the same thing on the flight controls and I didn't want nothing to change <laughs> and so for me that was my Chuck Yeager moment Chuck Yeager got his moment when he went through the sound barrier that was Chuck Aaron's Chuck, Ar uh, Chuck Yeager moment looping that helicopter Wow. And teach myself how to do it. Fun. And after that, I got this guy named Reiner Wilkie. He's their chief test pilot in for the for, uh, years ago. He was the chief test pilot for the U for the German Air Force flying this helicopter. And he was rolling in Europe. And I and I called him up on the phone. I said, Look, I'm having a problem with rolls. I'm a little bit scared about rolls. I don't want to do it wrong and screw it up. And so he told me on the phone how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so Reiner's a great guy. I love the guy. So laid back, cool, cool dude. 
and um, he worked for the chief pilot guy. I don't like, uh, <laughs> but Reiner, but Reiner, I like Reiner, and uh, uh, Reiner told me, all, you know, where I was, what I needed to do to do it right. So I went right back out and I started doing rolls immediately, and then I got into doing all kinds of stuff. That's when I taught myself the backflip, and I, that's when I, and I actually did a maneuver that where I. I didn't do it in air shows, um, but I did practice it quite a bit. And that was, I'd bring it to a hover at 2,000 feet, not moving. And instead of doing the backflip this way, I did a roll. And I went all the way like this, and it would fall down. Uh, I'd lose 500 feet doing the roll because I'm in a hover. And just when you roll it over, it just starts falling with the weight of the aircraft. But I recover and within 500 feet. So I got... I got it to where I could do loops and rolls and split S's and backflips and rolls and 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 I've I've I got to be real comfortable in the helicopter. It's just a lot of fun. That is so and, and so amazing. And and there, there's something else that that I, I I just want to make sure you you explain to someone because you've done something that I don't know if anyone else has ever done, putting a a camera moving rotating <laughs> on the blade on yeah. the hub to see yep. what is happening on these blades. And, uh, and I, don't, I, I don't think any yep. normal person knows what a helicopter <laughs> blade looks like. In, in flight. Let alone, yeah, yeah. let alone doing things you do with them. Uh, so I, I, am, I'm, I gotta tell you the truth. I saw Sikorsky did it on an H-19 helicopter. Okay. They put a camera on their rotor head somehow or another, and it's back in a 50. These. Mm. I don't know how they got that sucker bolted on there. It had been a giant thing. Mm. It and wasn't it's looking a right down the rotor blade. Okay, yeah. I'm going to say when, when first civilian. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so mine was the very first one after that one. And it was all, all mine. I, I, I remembered the idea. I said, I'm going to make a, I had a real good friend of mine as a welder. And so I had to make me a camera mount for GoPro. So I went out and bought a, a, a GoPro. And I had him build the camera mount around it, and I took the steel camera mount, and I, in the center of the rotor head, there's a, there's a, um, there's this little loop thing. It looks like a, a, the loop looks like something you grab a hold of and you pick the whole helicopter up with. Uh, that's not what it's for, but it's there. <laughs> but it's right smack in the middle of the rotor head. So I took that GoPro, the um, GoPro um, camera mount and camera and i bolted it right up to that thing and i made it so that the weight was exactly this perfect on both sides of that thing so that when it was spinning it wasn't offset a little bit mm -hmm. so i had to put weight on both sides of that sandwich yep ring and um uh, and my got the cameras looking right straight down the rotor blade so i did <laughs> this is in uh, charlotte north carolina and this is after i left red bull I bought my own VO 105 and started an aerobatic school teaching aerobatics. And by the way, I, I'm the first person to ever start or ever have, and still to today, uh, there's none today, the, the first ever uh, fully aerobatic helicopter training school. Yeah. Now, that is right now, I don't, yeah. Now, I have to tell everyone I don't have a, a 105 today to do it in, so don't call me and ask me if I can teach it because I don't <laughs> have one to teach in right now. <laughs> but back to the camera thing. So I got this camera on there, bolted down, rolled out of the hangar, fired it, I was scared to death it was going to come off, you know. So I just went to flat, uh, 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 started up, just got it to idle, let it run for about 10 minutes and then shut it off and then got up and looked at it, made sure it was all still there and nothing had moved and <laughs> got back in the helicopter and fired the thing back up again. And then I got it to full throttle and I, and I pulled it up to a hover. I got to hover for maybe two or three minutes and I was scared again. I landed it and shut it off and went back up on that rotor head and looked at it, made sure the thing was still there and nothing had moved and nothing had moved and nothing had changed. <laughs> and I grabbed it and shook it and it was still nice and tight. And I went, oh, let's just go for it. So, Got back in the helicopter and fired the thing up again and got it going and picked up the hover and took off and cameras are rolling. So you can go to YouTube 
I'm on YouTube all over the place. This particular thing, you can see the camera filming down the rotor blade, and and you can see the you can see the rotor blade doing its maneuvers. The rotor blade in the B105 goes a complete circle seven times in one second. Can you can you picture that? Yeah. Seven times yeah. in one second. And I got a camera bolted on that thing, looking down that blade and watching, seeing what it's doing. Um, so, um, uh, also the blades, when they're built, they have these things called a vibration absorbers. And uh, uh, they're, they're, there's these little perpendicular uh, uh, ball things that, that pivot. And so when the blade, when the blade flaps up, these, these pair of ball looking things are, look like your balls, they, hang, they fall down the other direction. <laughs> and so they counteract the weight of the blade. When the blade goes up, the balls go down and vice versa. And it's called a vibration absorber. So the rotor blade is vib sending this vibration down the blade. And before it gets to the rotor head, this vibration absorber takes the vibration out. And, and so it's no vibration at the rotor head. So you can see the vibration absorber in my camera. And that's why I bring that up is because now when you're filming, I can see the vibration absorbers. So when you're looking at YouTube and you're watching this thing fly, you'll see the vibration absorbers going up and down. And I've slowed it down like seven times on this thing. So you could see it and it's not too blurry in the background. And you see the vibration absorbers doing this thing. And then you can see, and this is a shocker to me to see this actually happen was uh, when I did a roll, I decided to go ahead, let's uh, it's going straight ahead, let's try to roll and see what this looks like too. So I go out there and rolled the helicopter and got it all the way around and came back down, it came up over. And after I did a couple of rolls, I flew back to the airport and landed, shut down, took it all apart and watched the video. And that vibration absorber, Every time I got the helicopter upside down, the vibration absorber stopped. Hmm. What's that telling you? It's wow. telling you the blade is not flapping. And it stopped because when I get it upside, when, when you, to, to roll, you have to pitch up just like you do an airplane. Take a stick and you roll over to the left. And, and when you get it halfway over, if you leave the collective up, it'll pull you down. So you have to drop the collective a little when you're upside down. There's a lot going on to do a roll. I mean, you're moving everything. But in the middle of all that stuff, you got to drop the collective. And every time I dropped the collective, that vibration absorber would stop. It wouldn't shake. So it's telling me and the FAA, I showed it to the feds. I said, check this out. And I showed it to showed them on the video. And I said, when this helicopter is upside down, it's happy. <laughs> it's happier being upside down than it is flying straight and level. And they said, and I said, here's the proof. Look at this. The vibration so, absorbers don't, don't even moving a bit when it's upside down. And so is it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was really happy in, in so much as the army saw it. So the right guys in the army saw it. It made around the whole circuit. I ha had about, it's over five million hits now on, on YouTube. And um, the army saw it a couple of years ago and they called me up and said, Hey Chuck, we want to, we want, would you let us use that clip and we'll give you full credit for it. That it's yours. Um, so we can add it to the training department here at the U S army flight school for every new helicopter student that comes through the course. We want to show them this and what the rotor blades are doing. And I said, absolutely. It's yours free. Take it, do it. I, I love the idea of helping um, our army or our government get better at what we do. Wow. So that was a fun that's, moment for me too. That's fantastic. Well, Chuck, before we get, uh, we have one last thing that uh, we need to do if you're ready for it. And that is uh, social flights okay. fast five. So uh, Chuck, Aaron, okay. are you ready for social flights fast five? Let's try it. <laughs> All right. I'm, 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 might questions. be a slow five, but let's try it. <laughs> five questions. <laughs> and uh, there, there are no wrong answers. Okay. Ready? Okay. Okay, go. First one. What is the worst 
helicopter or airplane you ever flew? An instrument. <laughs> Did you care to elaborate it's, it's, on that? It's kind of, yeah, uh, it it flies you're fine. You're taking me fly, off the hook for it, my story about how hard it was when I flew it. So you're taking me off. You're making it easier on me. Yeah, you know, it's it's the throttle movement. Uh, those things you have to. There's no auto throttle on that thing. There's right. No, there's, there's no, no governor. No governor. You have to do it with your your own hand. So you not only using this left hand to, to roll the throttle on and off, but you're using the same hand to pull the collective up and down. So this hand over here is a busy, busy guy. And that <laughs> Enstrom has got these heavy rotor blades on it. And so that heavier than most, they're real heavy. And so to control the rotor RPM, you have to roll the throttle a long, get my hand in the picture here. You have to roll the throttle a long ways to get the rotor blades RPM to come up, and um, and and once you get the RPM all the way up to where you want it, you got to back off on it, back off on the throttle, and get it to <laughs> so it'll stay there, you know. And if you all lost right. any rotor RPM, it was harder to get it back again. So it was it was just okay. hard to fly. That is our first perfect answer because it completely means none of it was my fault. All right, I love you. <laughs> all right, all right. Number, number two. two. If you had to go back to one moment if you had a chance just to go not to change things just to go back and re-experience one moment uh that you could pick out in your life or something that did what would that be a uh, flying you talk about doesn't matter you're you talking about you, flying you answer it any way you want if there was something you could go back to just for fun for five we're, minutes we're not talking about stacks we're talking about flying helicopters right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's nice that that's what came to mind when i said five minutes but sure go ahead Chuck. <laughs> Well, the, the funnest thing, flying helicopters, let's keep this show clean. Um, probably it was me flying out west in the southwest. Uh, they've since blocked this area off, but there used to be an area in the Grand Canyon where you could take a helicopter and you could dive down into this valley and the walls were 1,500 feet vertical and they were only like 200 feet across between one wall and the other wall. And you could take a helicopter, you could dive down this thing 1,500 feet to a river and fly down there and fly around. I got, I got all that on video, so wow. I can't prove it. And <laughs> that's, the, that's the funnest flying I've done is doing that stuff. Awesome. Great answer. All right, number three. If you had one person that you could spend some time with, dinner, drinks with, whatever, living, dead, anywhere, but if you had a chance to spend a little time with someone, pick their brain, or just hang out, who comes to mind? dad yeah oh another excellent yeah. excellent answer that's wonderful he he would he, he, he was my goal post yeah. that is absolutely wonderful and it sounds like he it, yeah. it, there's just everything in aviation that he brought to you and so many more things as well yep he did yep got i got a ton of friends i love but my dad was <laughs> He got me in it, and I'm still in it because of him. That's still awesome. on slide today. Yep. All right, number four. There was, if you could go back in time, if there was one thing you could tell to your yourself back in the when you were a teen or 20s, so you know the the younger Chuck Aaron, the young, mm -hmm. dumb, innocent, whatever you want to put on it, whatever label you want to put on it. Um, yeah. Uh, what would you say about Chuck Aaron? <laughs> No, it doesn't matter. You, you, you get a chance. You get one chance to go back there in time and uh, and sit down with your younger self. What would you tell? What I tell myself would be I I tell myself to study harder at school, learn math, more math. You know, English. You need English, but you don't need that as much as you need math and engineering. And that would have made me a a better test pilot, a better hmm. everything in aviation. So I, I, I do kick myself in the butt a lot for not paying more attention to math in high school. It's, it's a, it, it really is probably the best subject to accelerate in for anybody. Excellent. Helps you everywhere. Helps in every field. Excellent. Helps Listen in every up, field. Kids, grandkids, anybody who's got anyone they can talk to, grab a hold of that mm. person. This is, this, this is a, there's a common lesson here. All right. Last there one. Is. Last one. We're going to okay. end on a note here. 
Um, what was either you pick the the dumbest, the funniest thing that you ever saw during your flying career? It doesn't have to be something you could have done it. Someone else could have done it. But is there anything that comes to mind that you sit there and you just just as a head shaker or made you laugh? Well, there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> How about uh, in Germany, the helicopter hit and it was the... Oh, oh. <laughs> I mean, I could tell you a bunch of crash ones. <laughs> <laughs> I went in, but I saw some cool crashes. This, this, this one guy, he's flying a, he's flying a Cobra helicopter. I won't tell you his name. I know him. And he flies, he's, he, he's, he's, put so on this little kind of a show thing for this local group. You can't do aerobatics in a Cobra, but you can do hammerheads and stupid things. And uh, he, he got done and he came back in to get gas. Well, the gas pump was was up against within six inches of the wall of a building and had a real long hose so you could be plenty far away from it and land way away from it, and, you know, fill up your airplane with the, with a the fuel pump. And this dodo bird hovers up next to this thing and someone's filming him. Actually, there's, there's, it's, it's on YouTube. You can look it up. You can see it on YouTube. And he, and he hovers up to the, hovers the helicopter up to the building and everything's go, going fine, but I see what's coming. <laughs> And he lowers down, and you see, and he, and he gets his rotor blades over the roof of the building. Oh, He's no. that close. And, and I see him, he's starting to land. I'm going, oh, he needs to get on the ground, like, now. And he doesn't, and he keeps coming down, and the skids finally touch the ground, and everything's still okay. And I'm screaming, I'm, and my head's just ripping off like, this is not going to last long. And sure enough, he lowers the collective. And when he lowers the collective, the coning and the blades, they go flat. And when the coning went flat, it went right into the roof of that building. And it <laughs> ripped the rotor head and transmission right out of it. <laughs> Just tore it to pieces. Oh, what a no. Dodo bird. Oh, oh. Anyway. All right. Well, <laughs> on that note. <laughs> Chuck, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thanks to Ashley, your tech director there in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Bye. Your daughter. Thanks right to on. both of you. Uh, I am grateful for everything that you've done for aviation uh, and for all of us and keeping us entertained and educated and, and so many things that you've added. Uh, I, I really do appreciate it, and I'm, I'm fortunate to call you a friend, so thank you so much. Jeff, thank you. I had a ball. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You got it. I've been a, a very wonderful. fortunate guy. I've been a very fortunate guy. God, oh, I got to say this. God has taken care of me. I'm still alive because of him. So take that as it is. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Right. Have a wonderful evening. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, everybody. And thanks to all of you who do everything to support general aviation as well, because that is why we're here. And every time you get out there and fly, you support general aviation, your local FBO, it all makes a difference. And uh, we're just all here to a rising tide lifts all, lift all ships. And so we will see you again next Tuesday, March 12th, with, at 8 p.m. Eastern time, as always, with Kermit Weeks, who is preserving history with the Fantasy of Flight Museum. Cannot wait to have Kermit here on the show. We're back again then on Tuesday, March 19th, with YouTube's favorite pilot and AAP mechanic, Chelsea Smith. And then on March 26th, Janice Sullivan from the Solar Flight, the first human being to fly a solar only powered aircraft. We'll be telling that story, look that one up, another great episode here on Social Flight Live. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight, and I wish you all blue skies.